So these chairs came in handy, huh? <laughs> yes, these chairs did come in handy. You know, it's it's funny since uh, we really started yeah. this journey, right? It's like um, these are the chairs I brought down to see you interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some incredible celebrity guests. I mean, you're at what? I think 270 shows? 600. You're at 600 shows? Oh, okay. I could have sworn your book mentioned 270. No, it said, I think, 500 when I wrote the book. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Now, uh, so since then, now we're banging on 600. Yeah. Well, this book, um, you know, from the projects to profiles of memoir, I highly recommend if you're interested in interviewing, um, working in broadcasting, or really just, man, a squeaky, squeaky, uh, really just trying to understand the overall vision of what it means to work with other human beings in the capacity that you do, right? Because that was really the essential tone the whole time um, as I was reading it. You, you you highlighted a lot of series of different comments and moments, but really it was ultimately how it informed your empathy towards living in general. Um, f from starting in your sports career, right. working into broadcasting, you getting that first sound job, yeah. right? It's uh, It was the whole thing is really shaped the person you are today. And I, I really appreciate um, how much value you put into those moments without making it about you. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, it's a testament to your character. It's been a long journey. <laughs> As I said, 600 shows. We're coming up on 600 shows. Yeah. And uh, just going to move this closer to your face. Sure. Yeah. Originally, mm -hmm. uh, we were doing another show called Special Edition. Right. And that was a news magazine for Time Warner. And I always go back to the uh, studio and say to the, the, the staff, I just had an interview with Gladys Knight or with Danny Aiello. <laughs> and it was like 40 minutes. <laughs> and, and the segment that I was sc scheduled for was a four-minute overview oh. of that celebrity. And I'd say, I, yeah, I have 35 minutes of a great interview. Mm -hmm. Well, we should do a long form show and call it Profiles because the celebrities love to talk about their career other than, you know, the five or seven minutes they get on Jimmy <laughs> Fallon's show, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or Jimmy Kimmel's show. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, how's your latest project and how you doing? Good. And, and that's it, you know. So we were able to really get into the in-depth interviews with these iconic celebrities, and they loved it. Because they enjoyed talking about how they got started, right. what inspired them to get into the business, mm -hmm. and their keys to success. And ultimately, I think our goal was to, to create episodes that were inspiring to people. Right. And I hope we accomplish that. We well, continue to do so. I mean, you certainly have accomplished it. Your, your, your roster of uh, interviewees is just in, incredible. I mean, you cover ranging from... Muhammad Ali, you know, George Foreman to Joe Namath to, you know, Joan Rivers, you know, it's like you, you cover every single category and not even what is mentioned in this book from what I've witnessed, you've interviewed business professionals, NASA engineers. That's right. So, you know, I guess my overall curiosity is, do you think that there's one essential lesson that, um, <laughs> has been just kind of like knocking on the door of your conscious a little bit well, to tie everything together. Yeah, the underlying message as a journalist mm -hmm. is uh, preparation. You know, especially when you're interviewing people like Dr. Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. Dick Cavett, yeah, right. D Deepak Chopra. Right. These are all intellectuals. You know, so you go into the interview and you say, yeah, am I over my head here mm -hmm. with these people? because they're real intellectuals. And what balances the playing field is preparation. Mm -hmm. Because if you're prepared, I mean really prepared, where you put in seven, eight, ten hours of, of research mm -hmm. in formulating that interview, the celebrity, not, no matter how iconic they are, they respect that. Right. And they identify it immediately. And they all say the same thing. Mickey, you, you've done your homework. <laughs> You know, so that levels the playing field, and now right. you have a chance of, of getting a, a compelling interview from them because they respect that you did your research and you're prepared. And you bring this up specifically about Deepak. Deepak in, in Chopra, yeah. yeah. Um, were you intimidated by him? I mean, I always imagine he's 
uh, extremely on the ball, but <laughs> has this almost like Tiger Woods Zen quiet, uh, you know, this quiet, powerful energy feel yeah, to him. Yeah, you hope they're kind enough to, to allow you to feel that you belong with them. Right. That's the way I go into the interview. <laughs> and uh, you, you try to rely a little bit on your personality mm -hmm. to loosen them up a little bit, which I did with Deepak. And uh, he does have a sense of humor, which was, is seldom seen on other interviews. And uh, once uh, he realized that, I, as again, uh, that I was prepared and ready to go, and I did read his, but again, if I go in with the attitude, if they have a book, I read it. Mm -hmm. Today, it looks like you read my book. Well, I, I didn't read it today, but yes. But I appreciate that. <laughs> right, you know? of course. So if they have a book, I read it. If they have a CD, I listen to it. Right. If they have a trailer to a TV show or a movie, I watch it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't, you can't do what we do and wing it. Right. You know, uh, one, I once had uh, Carol Channing, who did 5,000 performances of Hello, Dolly. Wow. And she was on, because she had appreciated so that I knew a lot of things in the interview that most people would never ask her. Hmm. And, and she said, Mickey, I can't tell you how enlightening and refreshing that is. I was just on a TV show and I sat down and the interviewer said, so Carol, what is it you do? I mean, the interviewer wasn't even aware that she had done 5,000 uh, performances of Hello, Dolly. Is it weird that I'm starting to sweat just hearing this story? <laughs> it's, like, it's like the worst possible fear, right? Where someone's like, you don't know yeah. who I am? Yeah, yeah. So, so once <laughs> uh -huh. you show them that you're well-versed in their history, right. they're all in, Yeah. usually. Well, let's talk about your history a little bit. Sure. Because uh, we've known each other for what, maybe four or five months now. Well, I think more than that. Well, has it been? Time is flying. Yeah. I think it's at least over a year. Right, because I got here maybe in May. So yeah, almost yeah, a year. Almost a year. Oh my yeah, gosh, yeah. it's great. You know, it's wild, like opening yeah. the business yeah. and the shows that we've done and the amount of times you've been by. That's really, yeah. really something. Yes. But your history, I found very, very interesting. Um, you really got started being exposed to the intricacies of humanity through sports, it seems. Well, I grew, grew up, the name of the book is From the Projects to Profiles, project representing uh, the New York Housing Authority. You know, we call them the projects. Yeah. And uh, it, they were developed after World War II. Mm -hmm. This is 1958, right? In yeah, South, yeah. South so, you, so my father had come back from World War II, he was fought for five years in the Philippines. Oh, man. So now he comes back. He's like 31 years old, no education, no job, no family. Mm. So you, they, the soldiers were all starting late, and there was no housing. Yeah. So that's when they started to, they built all these projects. Oh, wow. And the rent was reasonable, and everyone was in the same boat, which was they were trying to get started late. Yeah. And no one had any money. Did people look down on the development of these projects? No, no. It was a great place to grow up, actually. Hmm. Because you had 200 kids every day out in the park looking to play ball. So, you know, I played baseball, football, basketball. And there was, matter of fact, we used to run home from, from fourth, fifth, sixth grade, change our clothes, and run down to the park. If you didn't get there fast, you couldn't get a court. <laughs> You'd have to get next, you know. Right. So you'd ran, run down there quickly, so you'd, you'd be able to play immediately. Right. And so it was a great place to grow. A lot of lessons were learned. You had to be tough, you know. It was a tough place to grow up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I realized early on that if I was ever going to get out of this situation economically, that sports was my key. My father was a great baseball player. Really. So I inherited his his athletic genes. <laughs> The Mickey Mantle gene. Yeah, yeah. He, was good, <laughs> but he would have been a pro baseball player had it not been for the war. Hmm. He's a good hitter, good field. He, he, was, he was very good. So uh, from an early age, I was always the best athlete in my age group. Hmm. Baseball, football, basketball. And uh, I remember going to my high school, which was New Dorp High School on Staten Island. And it was a perennial powerhouse. They had just won the city championship the year before I started high school. 
So I assumed that I would go there and be their next big star. <laughs> so I see the first day it says football meeting tryouts three o'clock, and I go into the gym and it's five hundred other kids <laughs> sitting in the stands that were bigger than me, stronger yeah. than me, faster than me. And I said, "Oh my God, how's this going to work? I'll be lucky if I make the team, let alone be the next big star." Mm -hmm. So in those days, we had what they could, so many kids in the, in the school. It was like four thousand kids. They the freshmen had late session which means you didn't even start till 11.30 in the morning. Wow. And you went to 5 o'clock at night. So what I would do is I would get up 8 o'clock, put my workout clothes on, go to the park. And I, I, I was still playing all the sports in all the leagues. Right. But I thought I needed an edge somehow to find my spot amongst these 500 kids in the bleachers. So I would get up and run sprints, push-ups, sit-ups, agility drills, Go home, shower, and then go to, to school. And I did that for months on, on top of months. And uh, I ended up making the team as a sophomore. And, and I played. I was a starter. And then my junior year, we were, we were very good. And I think we lost our first game, 12-7, to John Adams from Queens. Never forget. And then we never lost again. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we we won the city championship uh, my senior year, mm -hmm. and uh, I won the city scoring championship. I scored the most points of any other person in the city of New York my senior year, which got me a scholarship to a college called Missouri Valley College on a football mm -hmm. scholarship, and that was my goal from the start. Wow! But I got to tell you one more story yeah. that I think you you'd enjoy. Uh, we before I told I, I mentioned that we all one thing we all had in common nobody had any money. Mm. So here I am. It's my last game of the season. We're playing Curtis High School, and there's ten thousand people in in the stands. And the week before in practice, my shoe ripped from the sole. Hmm. My my cleats. All right. And I said, oh, what am I going to do? I'm, you know, this is everything to this last game. You know, I'm going for a scholarship. I'm leading the city in scoring. Mm -hmm. What do I do? And it never dawned on me to go to my parents and say, you know, I had this problem with my shoe. And I'm concerned because I'm afraid it'll rip and I won't be able to play. I, for one game, I would never burden them to do that. Mm -hmm. So I talked to the trainer. He said, don't worry about it, Mickey. We'll, we'll just tape it. So the shoe become part of your foot. You know how they, you ever see them where they do yep. it? And that's what they did. And I ended up, I scored two touchdowns that game, won the city scoring championship, and got my scholarship to Missouri Valley, which changed my life. That's lucky tape then. Yeah, it was right. good. There was a, I couldn't get it all. You had to, they had to cut it off. Well, you take it all the way to Missouri at this track, uh, you know? Yeah. And then when I got to Missouri Valley, the first thing I know, in your locker, they had new shoes. I said, oh, I like college. So you, you brought up something really interesting there, right? The difference in mentality. Yeah. Right. Where you wouldn't yeah. ask your parents to burden. Yeah. You wouldn't burden your parents with the request to get new cleats. You know, I wonder about this. Right. Because the greatest generation of Americans was yes. during World War Two. Yeah. And then they leave these theaters of war. They come back to the United States to populate our nation with the ideas, the discipline mm -hmm. and the structure that everyone in wartime, whether you were working in factories or in the hospitals or on the field. Yes. They really had this collective understanding of the way Americans should operate. <laughs> yes. Fast forward to today, oh. right? Where it's a lot of um, interesting requests. If, <laughs> yeah. you know, in a more modern setting, if that situation were to happen, mm -hmm. the, you know, the extreme example would be the person would have a breakdown mm -hmm. and say, you know, woe is me and be begging for some sort of handout. B basically, this is where I'm coming to, right? Yeah. You grew up um, with a father who, what you said did two tours in the Philippines? Well, he was there for five years. Okay, so one tour. I, I don't even. And in those days, it was during the World War Two. Right. So you were there, yeah. and you weren't <laughs> leaving until the war was over. What did he teach you about um, your approach to people, your approach to challenges? I mean, was there some sort of formative passing of a torch from those lessons to you as the very first example of the greatest generation's progeny? Yeah, I, I don't know if it, it came as much from my father as it did my mother. Really? Because no one in my family had ever been to college. Wow. 
And she would always say to me, Nikki, I said, I want you so badly to, to go to college. Hmm. But, you know, you're going to have to earn a scholarship to make that happen. Hmm. My father, on the other hand, what he lacked financially and, and what he lacked in education, he made up for in personality. Everyone loved him. He was always the life of the party. <laughs> <laughs> and and he had friends all over the place, and, and so I took his I think his personality uh, from him and my work ethic from my mom, hmm. who was great. She she was you know, and when when I was in college, interestingly, uh, I, I you know I remember the the first day I was there, they had a speaker on stage, and he said, "Look to your left, left. Look to your right." In, three, in, in four years, only one of you will remain. Hmm. And I remember saying to myself that first day, well, I know it's going to be me because I would never disappoint my mother. And that was my driving force. <laughs> Whatever gets done. You know, I said, I, they may disappear, they may drop out, right. but my mother would be devastated. <laughs> right. So, so I got to figure out a way wow. to get out of here with a degree. And, 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 and you know... The next thing he said, he said, you know, you're all here for degrees. Hmm. And he said, you probably most of you don't even know what they represent. So I'm going to tell you. He said, uh, you're here for a BS. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. And he said, that stands for bullshit. Mm -hmm. And he said, and after that, you're going to look for to get an MS. And he said, that's more shit. And he said, ultimately, if you're, if you're lucky, you'll get a PhD. And that stands for piled higher and deeper. <laughs> and this was my orientation as a freshman to college. I, I respect that. I wish more people <laughs> had conversations like that today. Right? Like my father is a PhD. He's a, yes, he's a physiologist yeah. and um, works in the medical field. Um, so he's more research. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, as much as I respect the length of time it takes to become a scientist or an engineer or a lawyer, all things that you have to go to school for. Yep. I'm not sure if I agree with college as an institution okay. right now. I think um, someone giving advice like that is <laughs> something that is sorely needed this day and age, right? Yeah. Just straight, straight to the core of the matter, no bullshit. Like, you know, yeah. wake you up out of the reality that you think you're in yeah. so that people can start engaging with the world. I agree with that. And, you know, one anecdote that before we leave this, this topic of uh, your roots and growing up and what, it, mm -hmm. what, what, what you instilled in believing and all of that, um, I guess about 10 years ago, I had actor um, Eli Wallach on the show, who, if, to refresh your memory, he was Tuco in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Ah, oh, great movie. Right? And he's yeah. done 100 other movies, but right. that's my favorite of his. Yeah, he's the best. He also did The Misfits with Marilyn Monroe and Clark Gable, their last film. So we, after, it was a great interview. He was 95 at the time. Wow. And he had just finished doing the, the last Wall Street movie. Okay. And after the, it was a great interview. I was so thrilled sitting down with him. And after the interview, he said, Mickey, do me a favor, t take a walk with me. That had never happened in all the 600 episodes. I said, it'd be my honor. Yeah. So it's a June day, and I'm walking up Broadway with Eli Wallach. Pretty cool. I said, that's a good day. <laughs> <laughs> so it dawned on me. I said, Mr. Wallach, where are we going? Mm -hmm. And he said, he had a bag, a plastic bag in his hand. He said, these are old, an old pair of shoes, and we're going to the cobbler to get them fixed. And I he thought I'd be funny. And I said, Mr. Wallach, why don't you just go to Macy's and get five new pair? He could certainly afford it. Mm -hmm. And he grabbed me by the wrist. I remember, and he stopped me in the mid-stride, turned around, looked me straight in the eye. And he said, Mickey, I grew up during the Depression. And he said, back then, you know, we didn't buy new, we fixed old. Mm -hmm. And I've never been able to shake that. And he was 95. Yeah. And I said, man, besides doing the show and having the thrill of interviewing these people, look at the life lessons that come with each interview. That's yeah, amazing. I mean, you have many of them in quotations I, I at never the end forget, of your book. I, it's almost like it was yesterday. Yeah. But he could never shake his upbringing and his roots. Hmm. 
you know, that depression and growing up hungry without anything new stayed with him his whole life. And you think um, 1958, moving to South Beach, engaging in sports, eventually becoming a coach, expanding the horizons of what social paradigms were standard then, which we'll get to in a second. Yeah. You, you still feel that that is carried with you? Oh, it's a part of me. Yeah. You know, I mean, my birthday was recent. And, Happy uh, birthday. Man. Well, yeah, it's passed, but, you know, thank you. Sure. And, and who, who calls me on my birthday? But the kids I coached in high school wow. in the 70s and, and the early 80s, <laughs> wow. the, you know, my players. Yeah. Hey, coach, how you doing? Happy birthday. Wow. So I've still remained friends with them. You know, um, I had some interesting, you know, we had some, again, some great teams hmm. when I coached basketball. We were the first team from Staten Island ever to make it to the city championship game. Because Staten Island, you know, you're playing against the Bronx mm. and Brooklyn, <laughs> and, you know. So we ended up playing Dewitt Clinton in the city championship game. We were 23 and 0 going in, and Clinton had 6,000 boys, and my high school had 600. Jeez. So you know, can imagine the competition we were up against. Yeah. And we lost by six. Oh. But that year we were rated in the top 20 in the country. So those players are lifelong friends. Wow. And they call you every year wishing they you call me every year. And I, I and I there was some things I wrote about in the book that mm -hmm. that, that uh, stay stay will stay with me a lifetime. At one point I remember we had just finished a, an undefeated season, 20 and 0. And the principal called me down to the office. <laughs> and uh, congratulations, you know, 20 wins, no incidents during the games and, or after the games. And I said, great. And at that time, they wanted to move the school to where it was on the North Shore near the Staten Island Ferry into the Mid-Island section, which the high school became available. The old New Dorp High School had a new high school, so that old one became available. And they wanted to go down there. But I, most of the kids on my basketball team were African-American. Mm -hmm. So the principal looked at me, congratulations. So then he said to me, we have one problem, Mickey. You know, you have too many African American kids on your basketball team. I was floored. I was floored, and I coached my kids, and they never got into trouble. You know, when we went to to play games, they had suit and a tie. Yeah. You know, they all doing well in their classes. And the reason is they were getting a lot of hate mail from the mid part of Staten Island. Oh, wow. That they didn't want all of these African American kids to come to the Mid Island section of the island because it was predominantly white. Mm -hmm. So that that was that was a, a real dilemma, you know. And uh, you stuck to your guns. Well, yeah, but I, <laughs> I became the bad guy. You know, they they would have these meetings with the athletic department to try to think how they can overcome this issue. Oh, really? You know, of, and, and I used to say, you know, I don't see them as African-American. Right. I don't care if they're pink, blue, green, Indian, white. I, I judge them on their talent and their character. Right. And that's all I want to do. You know, but as it turned out, mm -hmm. um, they, they, you know, they made the move and, uh, you know, they, they just, they, they, because the perception because our team was so successful, the perception of the school that I was coaching at was it was predominantly a black school. In reality, it was only 15% black. Hmm. But I created a perception. As much of a positive one as it was, Right. they wanted something that was wider. Ooh. <laughs> uh, that's um, In that moment, did you feel that the things that you were working for led you to this opportunity to become the leader that you respect? Yeah, I think so, because I, I stood up for the kids. Right. Uh, I realized who was uh, going to support me and had my back, which yep. was, you know, not too many people. People, I was disappointed in a lot of people that, that didn't come and support what I was trying to do and what I was trying to say. Right. And uh, I lost a lot of friends over it. Wow. Maybe not so much friends, right? Probably not. Yeah. But I, the, the kids who I coached in those years, they remain my friends 
30, 40 years later. So it's interesting to think about the time you spent with said friends, how many years until its conclusion. Yeah. And yet now, how many years later yeah. have you still affected those that were working with you as your athletes? They right. still call you. Right. So you chose the right ROI. I think so. <laughs> I think. But I just wanted to mention that that was part of my coaching career. Right. And I had to battle racism right. on top of trying to do a good job as a coach. And it really seemed that that was a critical keystone moment for you um, in terms of your interest in humanity and the diversity between each individual's personality and soul. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, my, my curiosity for that is, was that when you started feeling the ball rolling towards where you wanted to explore? Um, well, I always wanted, I've always wanted to be in television. Oh. I went to college, studied communications. Right. <laughs> but when I got out of college, I realized it was BC, meaning not you know, before, before cable. cable. <laughs> and it, the opportunities were, were slim. Right. You know, and if I did want to start out in broadcasting, I would have to start out in Boise, Idaho, <laughs> then move on to Topeka, Kansas. <laughs> and if you're really good, maybe Columbus, Ohio, oh, in, man. in a few years. Sky's the limit. It, and, and then maybe in eight to 10 years, I'll make it to Philadelphia. You know, so I realized the progression of what I wanted to do was going to be a long and difficult one. Hmm. And I had been away five years, and that's when I decided instead of, and I have one more story to, to put this in perspective. Sure, please. I, when I was graduating, uh, that's when I had to make a decision. Am I going to go into broadcasting or teaching? Hmm. You know, And I, I guess it was the end of my senior year, I, the football coach handed me a, a, a letter. And, and it had a big red logo of an Indian in the left-hand corner. So I opened it up, and it's a letter from the Washington Redskins. From the, no other than Vince Lombardi, at least that was his first year, 1970, as the GM and coach. Mm -hmm. Mickey, we'd like to invite you to our camp, which starts on blah, blah, blah. You know, our scouts have watched you play, and, you know, we think you'd be a good fit for the Washington Redskins. So, but I'm already enrolled in graduate school. Right. And coming from where I came from, education was really important, yeah. you know. And I thought about it and I said, you know, I just had four years playing in high school, four years playing in college, didn't get seriously hurt. I'm still in one piece. Mm -hmm. Do I go to graduate school or go try out for the uh, Washington Redskins? In those days, Alex, there was no money in pro football. Which is amazing to think about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in retrospect. I mean, like other, like Joe Namath made 400000 <laughs> wow. And that was like, wow. Yeah. The average play was making maybe 40 grand, 35 grand. Yeah. And they all worked in the off season as oh, wow. car salesmen, liquor salesmen. Mm. They all got jobs in the off season. So money was not the motivation for going for, for pro football mm. back in the early 70s. The money didn't come to the really the late 80s, 90s. Right. So I thought about it and I said, I was already enrolled. Yeah. And I said, ah, you know what? I'm going to keep going with the education. Yeah. Now, if it was like it was like it is today, where you're 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, I would have been on the next plane <laughs> to Washington, no, no doubt. Yeah. You know, and give it a shot and say, right. I'll worry about graduate school later. Sure. But, you know, that was my rationale. I never had been hurt. There was no really money in it. And I wanted to get continue my education. So I wrote Mr. Lombardi a nice letter. Thank you for the invite, but I've decided to continue my education. Mm. Best of luck this season. Now, when you went to get, um, when you went to graduate school to continue your studies in communication, yes, um, how different is that curriculum compared to the challenges that someone has to deal <laughs> with today in communications? <laughs> and do you look back on it now and just wonder if it was ever possible for someone to guess? that we'd be having the, the type of communication we're having today. I mean, just sitting down here yeah. so that you know we're in a room, single camera, two microphones, a Zoom P8, and a laptop. It's yeah. a very, very simple setup. Yeah. It wasn't like that. Well, it's funny you should mention that because aside from my show, I have a, a, a media company. Quest Media. Quest Media. 
And when we first started it, we were doing all kinds of events. <laughs> we were doing commercials. Right. We were doing uh, infomercial. I mean, music. Vi we were doing it all. I don't think we've got a call to do any of that stuff in the last five years. Wow. Because everyone with an iPhone mm -hmm. is a producer. It's true. So the times have changed. And it's good in a way because it gives everyone an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, and anybody could make it if they apply themselves and they're, they have talent. Right. Where back when I started out, it was a long shot. Wow. It and was a long shot. Yeah. You were, um, some people tried to discourage you from doing it. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, what happened was once I started to uh, coach, you know, the years went by, I ended up coaching high school basketball for like 13 years. Yeah. And, you know, now I'm in my late 30s. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go into television out of college. I didn't. Uh, so now I, I figured, you know, before it gets too late, I want to go give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And everyone was saying, Nicky, you're, you're crazy. You're too old. Well, you know, nobody's going to hire you. <laughs> you know, you couldn't get hired at 20. What makes you think you get hired at 38? Mm -hmm. And uh, that didn't deter me. Mm -hmm. You know, I just felt, hey, if, if this is something I want to do. I did study, though. I, got, I must admit, the, I, I, I got a job at Fox News by accident. And the first thing I do is that they would send their reporters to a, 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 re, a coach who would teach you how to work the teleprompter, how to write a news story, hmm. how to do stand-ups. So I, I immediately went to school to learn how to do it the right way. Right. At the same time, I got a job at Fox uh, as a camera, as a, as a uh, sound man. And now I'm watching all these, the best in the business. I'm like a sponge. So I'm learning from the coach, and I'm learning from the best, John Rowland, Jack Cafferty, Bill McCreary, Pablo Guzman, and uh, a, about a year went by, and uh, Rupert Murdoch took over Fox. Mm -hmm. First thing he did was cut out all the overtime. So, What does that mean exactly for well, those that don't understand? Uh, overtime meaning uh, when you go into uh, work a shift at Fox, Right. As a camera person or a sound guy on the cruise, you get time and a half. Well, you, you, well yeah, you work eight hours. <laughs> you cut that out. Yeah, so now you're <laughs> on a fire in Long Island, <laughs> right? And and you put in your seven hours, mm -hmm. and now you, you're going to be there another four or five hours because you got to interview the people who got burnt out of their homes, right. the fu the fire chief, what caused the fire. He cut out. So what happened was right. he didn't want to give time and a half. Right. After eight hours. So you would wait for the, your replacement reporter and crew, and then you go back to the studio. Mm -hmm. Problem is, the guys in doing this, you know, the base salary for, for camera guys was like 60000 but they were doubling it in overtime. Right. So they're really making 120000 so now they, he cut out the overtime. They're back to making six. They couldn't pay their mortgages. Oh, my gosh. And their car payments and all of that. So they said, what are we going to do? You know, it's just like getting your salary cut in half is what it was. Yeah. What it was um, for no reason. Yeah, for no reason. So now what they decided, they said, well, let's form our own production company. We have a lot of contacts in the business. Yep. And we'll moonlight to make up the money we're losing here. And we did, and I was part of that group. And at the time, we called it Group for Productions. And mm -hmm. because somebody knew somebody, we immediately got a, a contract with Time Warner mm -hmm. to do a news magazine, and we called it Special Edition. And I looked around, and they said, well, the only one here that could host the show, Mickey, is you. You're the only talent wannabe. The rest <laughs> of us are all tech guys. <laughs> So I became the host of the show and did uh, feature stories. That's and fantastic. then I hired a team of reporters uh, for the show. Now, I don't know how you feel about spirituality as a conversation, yeah. but I have this interesting belief um, that the more risk you take and mm -hmm. something that you want to do, the more you put into it, mm -hmm. 
the more the world just opens itself up to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious if you had this moment where you had to decide, right, between pursuing this career, taking on this hosting opportunity and expanding it outward. Was there a moment maybe quietly in your room where you were thinking to yourself, maybe I should take the safe road? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good point. Because at the time, I was making a lot of money. Uh, I was teaching. Mm -hmm. So I was at the top of the pay scale with my master's degree, right? Right. Uh, and I could have continued doing that. Right. And uh, I could have continued coaching, which was also financially rewarding. Right. Uh, but I always felt, even when I was young, I didn't want to be one-dimensional. You know, you have one life. And most of the people that I had worked with, who, that's all they did. They coached, they taught, they retired. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to experience more in my life. You know, I want, I, there's, there's more to it. And t to tackle a new challenge at 38, I think I was. It's bold. I loved it. Yeah. And I said, oh, man. And I remember the first day I worked at Fox. First day. And I, I got in by accident. Mm. You know, I played golf with a bunch of guys who worked at Fox. <laughs> <laughs> and one day he said, because I had a band. I was a, a, a singer as well. Right. That's another story. But, but, but I, I knew sound equipment mm -hmm. through the band. So one day we're playing golf and, and, and one of my guys, uh, friends said, hey, my partner's going on vacation next week. You want to sub for him as a sound guy in the news crews. I said, you got to be kidding. I've been wanting to try to do this for years. This is Mr. McCreary. No, well, this, this wasn't. This was Richie Murphy. Oh, but Bill me. McCreary was there. Right, yeah. He was the part of our, our, our golf crew. He was my mentor, right. Bill McCreary. So I go in. I said, but Richie, I don't know this equipment. I know music sound equipment. This is yeah. new, new to me. Just do what I tell you. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, Fox assumes that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> so we the first day we get in now you're gonna go to city hall for a news uh mayor's gonna give a press conference right you do that and then, so you simply plug into the soundboard that was simple after that was over they said go to lunch and then go to yankee stadium on the field and get sound bites with the players oh, wow <laughs> and here i am at yankee stadium like 4 30 in the afternoon I says, I'm all in this. Yeah, you're right. What have I been missing? Right. This is great. And just like any other business, you know, if they like you and they watch you closely, yeah. they'll say, can you come back tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Can you come back tomorrow? Can you come back next week? And one thing leads to another. And before you know it, you're part of the team, you know? Yeah. And that's how it all started. Wow. Wow. And I was at 38 years old. And I haven't looked back, and it's been on full throttle since then. Full throttle. I mean, there's so many guests that I could just bring up in this moment. Right. That would take up the entire time. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. But I think one of the most impressionable mm. guests you've had, um, you know, there was only one in a special recommendation, but I could hear that I'm thinking of, but I could hear there was an interesting tone difference in your writing. Really? About George Foreman. Wow. And it seemed that there was this celestial respect of his ability to be, <laughs> you know, uh, adaptable in the situation, both in sports and business and yeah. as, you know, a, a person of interest. Yeah, well, you're very perceptive because I think with, with George, we had very much, we had a lot in common, mm -hmm. not in fighting, <laughs> right. but in life. Right. Uh, he had quit. He had won the heavyweight championship and, and then he quit yeah. because he was getting older. And he said he had seven kids and the money was running out. So he decided maybe I should go back and fight, and make some more money. But at that time, he was just like I was. He was like 40 years old. Yeah. So he said he started from the bottom, like I did as a sound man. Right. He started fighting the lowly guys in the heavyweight division and he worked his way up. But he said, you know, I, you, you never, you always can reinvent yourself. There's always another chapter, you know, never age should never be a determining factor in your dreams and your goals. Right. And it wasn't for him. And I don't think it was for me. So we had a lot in common there. 
And uh, then he, he, we talked about the George Foreman grill. Mm -hmm. And he said, <laughs> they asked him uh, some company, you know, they wanted him to use his name on the grill. He said, well, what do I get? And they said, well, George, what do you want? He said, well, I have seven sons named George. Mm -hmm. Can I get a grill for each of them? <laughs> and he said, Vicky, I seriously didn't think I was going to make much money from this thing. <laughs> and three months later, I got a check for a quarter million dollars. <laughs> That's incredible. He says, I was shocked. I thought I was just going to get the seven grills. Right. He's like, I, I should have asked for more. <laughs> I don't know if he was pulling my leg or, right. or not, you know. Uh, so George Foreman. And, and he also shared something with me. Dorid, you always hope when you're interviewing someone yeah. that they'll give you something maybe nobody else has. Right. You know, that's always an ultimate goal during an interview. Of course. And he said to me, you know, during the rumble in the jungle with Muhammad Ali, yeah. I, I truly believe I was drugged during that fight because he was a heavy favorite going in you knew that right yeah he he believes that he believes that he believes because he said he he, he didn't feel right huh. you know and he said he thought somebody put something in his water oh. one of his handlers he right. felt they bought them off and they threw something some some kind of uh, drug or hallucinant hallucinant uh, into his water and he said, I, I, and Muhammad Ali said, I, I, I hit him with everything I had. And he kept saying to me, is that all you have, George? You know? Wow. And he said, but I, he did, he did beat me fair and square. Right. But he says, I do feel that I was drugged. Wow. You know, that's fairly common in boxing. Yes. Boxing is a pretty yes. dirty sport, right? Yes. You have some, um, I believe it was two Mexican fighters. I'm drawing a blank on their name. Yeah. One had concrete. In his glove. Well, there you go. Right? Yeah, so, so every time he got hit, it was being hit with a brick. Right. So, you know, that wouldn't surprise me, especially in that era where they didn't have as stringent of rules on how to tape. And Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And he reinvented himself from being the most hated man, the bad guy in boxing, to the most loved. Right. And trusted. And trust. Uh, He's like yeah. Ronald Reagan of athletes, right? Yeah. He like all of a sudden started working yeah. with products and everyone's yeah. like, I'll, I'll buy a GM. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In, <laughs> inventor, whatever. Yeah, he did them all, really. Midas mufflers. Uh, but he reinvented himself in, into this lovable guy. Yeah. You know, and he and he won. He came back and won the championship over Michael Moore in Las Vegas at I think 42 years old, something like that. Right. Yeah, what a what a nice guy. I loved him. And afterwards, he stayed with signed autographs, took pictures for like 40 minutes. Oh, that's amazing. Super guy. I always find that what makes us human really are our contradictions. Mm -hmm. And um, both my own personal contradictions and the contradictions that I discover as I am becoming more familiar with a different person is really what interests me. Mm hmm you have, like you mentioned, over 600 interviews with some of the most prominent people in America and abroad. How has the lessons of discovering contradictions in humanity informed your feeling on the human race today? Uh, that, that's a deep question. I, <laughs> Too deep? <laughs> Back to sports, Alex. <laughs> you know, I mean... Let's go to the Russian invasion mm. of Ukraine and yeah. use that as an example. You know, as a leader of a country, why would somebody want to do that? Right. And now they're bombing civilians, and Awful. you, you kind of lose your your faith in in humanity. But at the same time, you know, you look at the Ukrainians and they're up against Goliath. It's amazing, and they have not lost their spirit. So, you know, there's so many lessons to be learned there. And, you know, people in the United States now are saying, we don't care about the gas prices. If it helps Ukraine, we can, we can, we can swallow that, you know? Um, so anyway, I just, I don't want to get into politics, but uh, uh, it's a very sad situation for the Ukrainian people. And that president oh, he's amazing. was born to be where he's at today. You know, he was a comedian. I know he was. I didn't know that. <laughs> I had a I had a guest here um, in he between. He's a TV star too. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I had a, had a guest here in between uh, Randy Edelman and this wonderful yeah, yeah. interview from Ukraine. Yeah. And we were talking about what his life was mm. pre-1991 sure. when Ukrainian you know nationalism really took over. Mm -hmm. 
And it was, it's just so interesting to see the way the birth of that nation has taken um, root it, in Europe. It's so true. It, it really is this, uh, you know, Slavic spring, right? Yeah. It, but it's working. Yeah, absolutely. It also makes you aware of any problems that you might be experiencing oh, yeah. in your own life are minuscule. That's true. <laughs> They're minuscule. Yeah. And our hearts go out to these people, these brave, courageous people. And hopefully uh, things will work out in their favor in the long haul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so. You know, it's um, a scary situation. Yeah. We have some friends here at the studio who had some family stuck in Odessa. And so we were doing everything we could to get them to um, Moldova. Um, but the men were turned away at the border. Was, okay. Yeah, all, all the men apparently are turned away at the border and ushered back, back to fight. Back to the fight. Uh, there's also thousands of men from around the world that are trying to get into Ukraine. It's pretty badass, right? Yeah. <laughs> to help fight for them. Incredible. And before this war happened, they had no ties at all with Ukraine. Right. They just know the cost of freedom and they're willing to put they, themselves they on the line. They fight for democracy. I love that. You know, it's, yeah. those are real heroes. They are. They are. You know, it's, um, and it's interesting to see how much Putin has been contradicting himself. But here's the funny thing. It's like there's always this kind of quirky uh, ignorance yeah. to yeah. history. It's hard to understand almost. It's hard to understand. And as soon as you think you understand it, you're already in the trappings of the next contradiction. Absolutely. Right? Where we think we have Europe under control and now all of a sudden it's flipped completely on its head. You know, And I don't know how any country or any leader of any country will be able to look at Putin after this is over without seeing war criminal right. tattooed on his forehead. I just don't, I don't see how he could survive moving forward. Yeah. I think best case scenario would be really amazing if the Russian people yeah, that did would, something. And they're, tr they're trying. Yeah. But, you know, if you get arrested in Russia for prote protesting against the government, you get 15 years in jail. It's, in it's insane. You know, and they're still doing it. So they don't want any part of this. Yeah. You know, this is just one man's uh, delusion. Uh, you know, hopefully it's the last gasp yeah. of that, you know, that old school yeah. regime mentality. Yeah, you know, it's, it doesn't make sense, right? Because it's it's really p pathetic. Yeah. And almost like he's doing this because he's jealous. He was jealous of how uh, Ukraine, uh, the Ukraines have evolved. Mm. They were happy. It was a modern place. And, uh, you know, he's still looking for that old Russian re regime that failed decades ago. Oh, yeah. He's trying to bring back the USSR yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, and then it's not going to happen. And on the other hand, right, we have inventors here in America who are yeah. bringing us to Mars. So, <laughs> yes. you know, how do you view yeah. how do you view this new almost transhumanist spin on history? I mean, we're surely in a different decade than 2010. Right. Well, not even decade as in the year, but we're in a different universe <laughs> than 2010, right? Well, 2010, we were just starting to get regular cell phones. Sure. You know, teenagers well, were exposed. You know, it's funny you should say that because uh, I tell people this all the time hmm. and they scratch their heads like I'm from Mars. And I'm not. <laughs> I'm from Staten Island. <laughs> but but uh, when I went to college, yeah. there were no cell phones. Right. There were no computers. You know, I had an old typewriter, mm. and when I came home for Christmas, I asked my mother to get me another ribbon for the typewriter. You know, uh, when some I, I lived in a dormitory that had one phone in the lobby. Right. And when somebody called you, if you were on the third floor, they would say, Mickey, phone call. And if you were lucky <laughs> enough to hear them, you came down to that phone. Wow. So technology has advanced so far, not, mm -hmm. not only with phones and computers and everything else, but especially in our industry. Right. You know, now we're at 3D this. Three, I mean, the first 250 episodes we did was standard definition. Wow. Which in many cases is unheard of today. Right. Everything is HD or right. more. Or more. Right. <laughs> 4K, yeah. 8K. Yeah. So the advances... <laughs> are good for the industry because mm. the quality's off the charts good. Right. You know, we used to use, even when I was at Fox, three-quarter tape. Right. You know, which was about that big, and you would carry that big sound. The, yeah. the camera must have weighed 75 pounds. <laughs> Old Ikigamis. You had to be strong to carry those. 
-hmm. So the advancement is has been phenomenal. It's it's better for the. I mean, you know, I mean today everyone's on the cell phone twenty four seven. But that's my question. Is, we didn't have that. We had to deal with people face right. to face. So how how much how alienated do you feel that this time period is yeah, post cell phones? It's very aggravating. It's very aggravating. You know, it's even even if you wanted something done. Um, aside from from technology you just wanted to talk to a person right you know yeah i forget what who it was or where i was trying to get i just wanted to talk to a person about an issue i had with something and you can't get to a person anymore. it's true it's true you know you go from one <coughs> answer machine to another answer right. this and that, but you, you it's tough to talk to a person and i notice now it's getting to the point on a lot of the bills that you get Mm -hmm. They don't even have phone numbers on them. That's anymore. true. <laughs> There's no way to contact. So that, you know, you have to be an investigative reporter, <laughs> right, to talk to somebody, right? If you're lucky. Yeah, I mean, so I don't like that, right? Because I'm a people person. I've always been, you know, and you know, a lot of times with even with the email, I notice that people will take the liberty to be bold in an email, but mm -hmm. if you talk to them face to face. They lose that boldness. Mm. You can't respect that, right? No. I, I don't anyway. No. You know, you want to look into a person's eye, kind right. of see what kind of character they have and deal with them one on one as as a person. Of course. Yeah, I don't want to hide behind a keyboard when I'm corresponding with people. Yeah. It's an interesting shield. Yeah, it is. Right? It's like even though we have more access to people individually. Yes. You can hide behind the keyboard. You can hide behind your Instagram yes, posts. You can. Yes, right. You can. And this is an interesting kind of like dysmorphia that yes. relationship that I have with modernity. Mm -hmm. Right. Where there's mm -hmm. one of my favorite songs is Billy Joel Strangers. Yeah. Right. We all have a face. We take them out to show ourselves when yep. everyone is gone. Right. Every person has a face. And now, you know, I look at this as the golden era mm -hmm. of duplicity, right? The golden era of you can project something completely unfamiliar with your sense of self. And I wonder, while you're interviewing, depending on what age group the interviewee is yeah. for you, do you see any sort of like artifacts of that in your conversations? Well, it's when we, when we had the pandemic. Yeah, that's a good example. We tried to do Zoom. I, yeah. ha I hated it. Yeah, I can't do it. You know, and they say, you know, <laughs> you know, I have a mentor, Bill McCreary. He mm -hmm. passed away about a year ago. And, and, and what he used to tell me all the time, and you'll appreciate this as an interviewer. Mm -hmm. And you're very good at it, by the way. Thank you very much. And, and he used to say, <laughs> Mickey, whatever you do as an interviewer, never let them see you sweat. <laughs> <laughs> It's not easy. I said, Bill, is that a skill set? He said, you better believe it. <laughs> and, and yeah. you know, what does he mean by that? Well, sometimes, you know, <clears throat> you may ask a question that the person you're interviewing is not comfortable with. Mm. And they may get a little agitated yep. with that. Now, how you handle that agitation can determine the rest of that interview. Right. So I think what he meant was never let them see you sweat. You know, when you run into the to the barricades like that, uh, it is a skill set. How do you get around that and move on? Right. You know, and we all have our, our ways of doing that. You know, but huh. always smile. Yeah. That's it. And move on. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting kind of like meta yeah. concept on interviewing in general, right? Because the interviewee yeah. surely is the substance. Sure. But the interviewer is the form. Yes. And only the thing that's actually of concern, mm -hmm. the the idea of what's being created, the product itself, yeah. is a continuum between those two people. Right. I've always thought of myself as the interviewer, yeah. as a batting practice pitcher. Oh. And I want to groove my fastball right down the middle of the plate so that the guest hits home run after home run. <laughs> and you're like, I got it. I want to make them look good. Right. Not me. I'm the interviewer. Yeah. You see? So that's that. That's how I go into an interview. I'm a good batting practice pitcher. I'm going to groove that. I love that. Ball. That's so yeah. accurate. And another mistake a lot of interviewers make, and I write about this in the book too, is why are people listening? Hmm. Uh, yeah, you have to ask yourself that question. And in most cases, they want to hear the guest you have. They want to hear about Randy Edelman's life. Right. But a lot of interviewers make the mistakes of injecting their own personal 
and anecdotes, uh, personal stuff about themselves. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I was saying to, let's say, some, I'm interviewing somebody and uh, they mentioned Joe Namath. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I stopped them. I'm the interviewer. Yeah. And I say, yeah, Joe, I just met him in the bathroom at the Meadowlands during a Jet game last season. Nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. Nobody cares. They don't care. They want information about Joe Namath. Right. You know, keep your eye on the prize and what you're trying to do. And stop, in, you know, they don't care about you. You're the interviewer. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of inter interviewers make that mistake. And a lot of times the guests are sitting there saying, well, when is he going to get back to me? Hmm. And ask me questions. That's why I thought I was here, not to hear about his life, you know? Yeah, that's a little self-centered, right? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. But, you know, the, the sense of quiet and the listening is, is really part of the product, too, sure right? Is. Because without that empty space and without yeah. those corridors of conversation, like, you don't really go on a flow right. or a tangent of a particular subject matter. No. I think it's important also to critique what you do. Right. Right. You're interviewing me today. Will you watch that and critique it? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because I've done 600 episodes. I've critiqued all 600. Yep. Yeah. You know, and I watch and I say and I see a question with Dick Cavett and I say, damn, you know, I should have come back off of his answer and asked him this. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. Do you have one regret, like one particular question that you wish you asked somebody? I, I, no, I don't. I can't think of off the top of my head, but every good. interview right. has some of them. I can hear the frustration. Yeah. You know, why didn't I <laughs> right. ask him about that? He, it, was a, it would have been a perfect follow-up question to his answer, right. and which makes for a better interview. Right. So, uh, but by critiquing it, I'm getting better at answering those, uh, asking those follow-up questions huh. because I'm more aware. That I'm missing, I, I, you know, I, I missed the boat on a lot of interviews, and they could have been better if I asked those good follow-up questions. So now, when I'm in the interview, I'm aware of that, right? Because I have critiqued my performance, you know. And there's a lot of other things, pronunciation of words, mm -hmm. things like that. Grammar for me, you know. You can improve on those things, yeah. you know. And I not only want myself to watch it. I want my camera people to watch it. Right. They're amazing, <laughs> by the way. You know, do you see anything wrong with this shot? <laughs> you know, because unlike you, I think you're pretty much steady, right? One, you're, you're steady. With us, we have like four cameras, and some of them are moving. Right. You know, long shot, two shot, close up, boom, boom, right. boom, boom. And, and mistakes are made during that process. Right. But if you critique it afterwards you're less likely to make the same mistake again and again. Sharpening the saw, right? It's one of the seven essential habits of a highly effective person. Yes, and I can't tell you how many guests that I've had now, and I've had iconic guests. Mm. You're talking Don McLean, oh, uh, Darlene Love, and, and, and you know, uh, Greg Raleigh, you know, who was in Santana and Journey. They all say the same thing. Every one of them. They're trying to get better. Right. They're, they've been to the mountaintop for 20 years. They wake up. What, what's the first thing you do? I, break, I practice. Yeah. You know, once you start resting on your laurels, so, there's only one place to go, and that's down. Yep. So they, even at the pinnacle of their career, they still have the desire to want to improve and get better. Mm -hmm. And they haven't, none of them feel like they've gotten there yet. Right. It's amazing. <laughs> and these are Oscar winners, Emmy winners. <laughs> Well, I'm not there yet. I'm not as good as I can be. Insatiable. It's amazing. And, and, and that's one of the reasons they are successful. Right, exactly. Yeah. What is your approach? What, do you have a ritual to, to reviewing yourself? Is it like maybe you make a cup of coffee, you sit down, you make sure no one is around, you're in your favorite pair of pajamas, you let one yeah. sunbeam Sorry. get through your window, and you're like, okay, now's the quiet time. I know you're going to laugh at this. <laughs> okay. But my ritual is I always say to myself, why didn't I go into radio? <laughs> I wouldn't have to shave. I could wear old dungarees. And hang up jeans, the yellow tie. And hang up the tie. <laughs> And, you know, slouch in my chair. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. I, my ritual, uh, you know, starts really a, a day before. Mm. 
you know, because I, I review, make sure, you know, because I format my interviews yeah. a certain way. And one thing I love to do is go back into the history of the guest and find out something that they said about something important 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Right. And then read them what they said 15 years ago and then ask them how they feel about that today. I love you. Some of the answers you get are incredible. So let's let's do one, right? Because yes. I believe in your book you mentioned something about the John F. Kennedy assassination. Is that accurate? Uh, 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 Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a sensitive it's, subject. No, not not not. You know, uh, it, it's not. It, it's just that you know I was playing college baseball at the time. Yeah. And uh, we were on a Southern Spring tour, which meant we would leave our college and then play a college a day going south. Wow. That's what we did in the spring. And then you yeah. come back and play your regular season. So this one day we were in, no, in Memphis. And uh, we pulled over at Holiday Inn to have uh, lunch. And there was a little black and white TV in the corner. And we were just about done with our lunch. And all of a sudden, uh, fire engines and ambulance, police cars were racing by the hotel. And we all assumed there was a bad accident or a fire or something like that. And then on the TV set, it came on, bulletin came on, breaking news, Martin Luther King has just been shot at the, I think it was the Lincoln Motel. Um, so I asked the waiter, I said, can I say, where is the Lincoln Motel? He says, two blocks south. Whoa. <laughs> and I said, oh my God. I had never been in this town in my life. Yeah. And here I am, the two hours that I was in that town, he was assassinated two blocks away. Wow. So what we did at that point is we got back on the bus and we left. Wow. By the time we got back to campus, the country was in turmoil. Detroit was on fire, Newark was on fire, St. Louis was on fire, Kansas City. The whole country was in turmoil from that incident. And a lot of people don't remember, but I think it was uh, two months after that, uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. And a weird one as two well. Two months, two months later. So those were the times in which we were living right. back then. But I do mention that in the book because I had Dr. Maya Angelou on, on the show. Talk about an intellectual. Right. <laughs> Am I worthy kind of thing, you know? <laughs> She's the greatest poet the country's ever had. And, and in doing my research, I found out that she was born on the day Martin Luther King was assassinated. Mm -hmm. From that day forth, and she was then in middle age, she never again celebrated her birthday until her death. Wow, that's a story. Because they were close. Now, you know, there's always those rumors. I, I have a particular interest in the RFK shooting, yep. you know, the yep. whole Sirhan, Sirhan yep. element to it. This strange kind of uh, like ornamental, um, can, you know, we'll call it what it is, a conspiracy. I mean, it's yes. what it is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Which is a very dirty word these days, in, in my opinion. Um, There's a lot of different conspiracies, by the way. Oh, yes, for sure. You mean about RFK? Both. Yeah. Yeah. And MLK. And, yes, JFK and Bobby. And a lot of the conspiracies uh, were that the oil powers and the oil companies here and abroad uh, wanted to get rid of both of them because they realized that they would rule the White House for 16 years. Right. And, and they were not friends of the oil industry. Right. So that was one of the conspiracies is that they were, they were, they hired this, this, Sirhan Sirhan and yep. and uh, the other fellow from John F. John F. Kennedy, what I can't even remember his name now. Uh, Oswald. Or Oswald. Mm -hmm. uh, that they were just hired guns by the yeah. oil companies to get rid of the power at the time. It's it's fascinating. You can go down a million rabbit holes, especially with the MLK assassination as well, where there's a lot of written documents of the FBI basically yep. coming to yes. determinations in dark rooms to figure out right. ways to essentially break up the formation of new 
centralized powers in America, which is finally having an organization to represent people of color in the United States. Right. But I've heard the same entity Have that you? they blame is the same <laughs> entity for RFK. Well, there was a movie in 1973. I'm going to mention this only because you just had him on your show. Uh, and it was called Executive Action. <clears throat> and that was their theory as well within that film. Mm. And you know who did the soundtrack for that movie? Randy Edelman. It was his first movie. Oh, really? In 1973. <laughs> I didn't know and that. you just had him on the show. Yeah, I should have I should have asked him about the assassination. But. Well, he'd have an opinion for it because he yeah. wrote the soundtrack, I mean, he, uh, the musical soundtrack to right. that film. And it was a low budget film, but but it was about the uh, assassinations and what was what they felt was behind both of them. Given the way communication has dramatically changed, the censorship issues that you know we're starting to deal with, and the rise of really, it's almost futile, right? It's almost like when the church had all the books in the in the in the uh, you know in their and their um, places of worship is the only way for you to study. It's almost like monastic, where <laughs> one person had all the information. We're slowly veering towards like those kind of monolithic principles. Mm -hmm. Do you worry that it's not possible for someone like MLK, not possible for someone like John F. Kennedy to deliver that speech where darker forces in the United States, the military industrial complex are people you should be worried, the Eisenhower speeches, yeah. these kinds of whistleblower moments. Do you worry that that's not really nearly as possible? Yeah. Well, it's certainly evolving. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, back back when JFK was uh, president. Yeah. He he was a womanizer. <laughs> yeah. Legendary one. Believe it or not, the press protected him. Yeah. Today, that would, you know, two things. Today, he would never get away with it. No way. Uh, there's too much coverage, you know, so. uh yeah, I, I think things are evolving now. You have to be, there's a camera on you every second. You probably can't leave uh, Soho Innovative Studios. You're probably on somebody's camera. Yeah. So is that a good thing? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Well, I think it's shaping our relationship and communications. Anyway. Yeah, it's a slippery slope at it the is. same time. Right. You know, because you don't have privacy anymore. Yeah. Final question for yes, you, yes. Mr. Burns. Yes. When we eventually get to Mars, which is very soon. The, you know, the, they hope to have a colony on there yeah. someday, which makes the Star Trek series very plausible. <laughs> all the more interesting, right? <laughs> because when that was developed, I mean, there was just a, an illusion. But today yeah. it's a reality. Uh, I mean, space exploration uh, I think is important for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, um, we can get hit by an asteroid tomorrow and there's no more Earth. It's true. Right? It would be nice to at least have some place somewhere in the universe <laughs> that we could go for a second for our summer home, you know, our vacation <laughs> home or something like that. Yeah. So uh, I, I think it's important that we keep exploring space and it's so exciting. I mean, we're just a... a, a, a grain of sand in, in our universe right so you know we just haven't been able to find out all the other things that it that it can offer us in the way of medicine and other races and you know we can't be narrow-minded to think we're the only ones right so i i want to get a condo on mars <laughs> Well, we'll be sure to hook you up with uh, someone we may know, which maybe will be. Maybe we can run the first TV uh, network from I'll, there. I'm all for it. We'll put it. We'll do a volumetric. <laughs> we'll shoot it in, and uh, we'll make it volumetric so people can put on their yes. new Quest glasses yes. and see us in I, 3D in the metaverse. And I want to say one more thing. Sure. You know, and, and I know you read the book, and I appreciate. That. Of course, thank you. You, yeah. you know, the last question I asked every every guest. All, all 600 episodes, is what do you hope that your legacy would be? So I just wanted to ask you, what do you hope your legacy will be? Because you're just starting out in your broadcasting career. 20 years from now, 30 years, what do you hope your legacy will be at that point? I just, uh, you know, the ultimate goal would be to just help defend a space of conversation where really um, deeply human, flawed, and controversial opinions are able to be shared so if i can contribute that as maybe one of the 
soldiers that's a uh, part of the collective that is required to keep that alive and thriving yeah. that would be an honor you know changing one person for the better be opening one person's mind yeah. to something um is really just the ultimate goal yeah well said and i want to say uh, the, my two favorite legacy answers are meatloaf who just passed away yes <sighs> he said i want it written on my tombstone i told you why i told you why i was sick <laughs> <coughs> I don't know if he got his witch. And the other one is from Chuck Barris, who before your time was the host of the Gong Show. Mm. Right? Very famous show. Famous show. Yeah. And and when I asked him about what he hoped the legacy would be, Chuck, he said, I want it written on my tombstone, gonged at last. <laughs> and, and I was reading his obituary in the Times. He got his wish. He did. It's oh, on, amazing. It's on his tombstone. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. This has been an absolute pleasure. And um, and we hope to have you back in, you know, if, uh, maybe in a year or something to hear more about these incredible interviews. Yes, and, yes, you yes. know, as a personal friend, you've done so much for me as an individual. And I just want to publicly thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I totally, I totally enjoyed this. You're very good at it. Thank I you. wish you nothing but continued success. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.